uh, top lip. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but a big thanks to Grant. He's come from the far side of Bellamina tonight. And uh, when we were thinking about who could come along tonight um, to share uh, a thought or to share a testimony, Grant popped to mind because he shared his testimony at camp. Now, I'm not going to steal your thunder here, uh, but it, it's very interesting. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it at that and I'll, I'll pass over. We'll just pray for you, Grant. Well, God, we thank you for this time together tonight. We thank you for this chance to come and to worship you. Uh, to be together as a church family. Uh, we pray now that you would be with Grant and that you would speak through him. And uh, Lord, we just pray that what it is that you're going to say through him, that that would, would um, Lord, just have a great resonance tonight with us, and that we would listen attentively, and that we would not just be hearers, but doers, that, would, that we would act on this message, Lord. Um, so please bless him, Lord, as he speaks. We pray this in your name. Amen. Yeah, so um, as Keith was explaining, I met um, Keith and Rebecca both about five or six years ago um, through camps. And I, a couple of weeks ago, woke up, thought I'd had a dream telling me that I was supposed to, to come to Bally Halbert and speak. But I got in the morning and checked my phone, and it was Keith Fulton had sent me a message on WhatsApp. <laughs> um, and I think I told him there now. I actually replied to him like half asleep. So, uh, so I phoned him back. And I was full of all sorts of questions, as, like, the main one being, like, why me? But uh, also just like, what was I going to speak about? How would it be received and all that? Um, like, where's Bally Halbert? <laughs> Stuff like that. Um, it's a nice place, first time sat and fit in it, like, so. Um, but he sort of said, cause, as he mentioned, um, he'd heard my testimony before, so by the time I put the phone down, I sort of knew roughly what I was going to talk about. And... Um, so that was that was that. I agreed to come here and speak. So, um, as he mentioned, he said he said it's interesting. Maybe begged it up like that. Um, I was sort of from I'm from non-Christian background. So my family aren't Christian. Um, never went to church. Nobody at school or anything. When I was young. Went to church. Um, no baptisms. No weddings. <clears throat> so I would say up until the age of six or seven, I had not heard the word church, which seems a bit weird living here because the place is coming down to them. Um, Fast forward way into my teens, um, up until mid-teens, living a completely normal, non-Christian life. Um, so never went to church. Um, there was a few sort of like mid to 14, 15 onwards, there was like a few turbulent years. So there was, there was a couple of deaths in the family. There was uh, mum and dad's marriage deteriorated. My dad actually lost his job and came homeless for a while as well. Um, so it was a pretty, pretty rough time. and. Uh, one day I was out, it was a really, really nice day, and I remember there was like a row in the house, the rest of the family were in the house, I was outside, and I had a moment of desperation, and I prayed, which was, but Keith sort of pointed out as well, at the time, and I told him, the, really, the weird thing was, so I was, I didn't use the label, but I was de facto an atheist, I didn't believe in a God, so initially I was set with this really, really weird, like I prayed, and asked God for help, and I thought like, Right, that was really weird. I don't know. I don't know what to do anymore. So, um, felt sort of compelled to pray. Felt compelled to dig out a Bible from somewhere in the house. I was like, there has to be one somewhere. Um, found one. Um, later turned up to summer camps with this like hundred-year-old King James thing. So people probably thought it's, it's you know King James only, but actually it was the only one in the house. And um, I had to find it in an attic somewhere. Um, so. That started sort of a really, really weird summer in my life when, so I had that moment. Um, I worked for a farmer down the road who was a Christian, and I'd worked for him for ages, and it's not that I didn't like him, but I just thought, he's a bit weird, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, but he's really, really nice, but I grew up with this kind of attitude that a Christian's being really, really nice. It's like there must be a catch somewhere. I was just really, really cynical of him. Um, so I worked for him, and... You know, at a regularly, he would invite me into the house and stuff. And at the time, I didn't really want to go home. He was halfway on my walk from the bus stop to the house. So he'd have been like, do you want to come in? And I was like, aye, why not? Um, he revealed to me one day then that he basically paid, he sponsored for a child every year to go to summer camps. So he was like, right, I want you to go. Um, and I literally absolutely hated the thought, but we didn't have much money, and it looked like such a huge amount of money. So I was like, out of politeness, I'll go. Um, so I went on that, and then that kind of, you know, at that point I knew a couple of Christians, 
And then whenever I went to camps then, the numbers kind of blew up and suddenly I met all these people who all seemed really, really weird. <laughs> and like, it shocked me. I remember, I remember sitting at night, it was a dorm time and I did a prayer and uh, it seems really silly looking back at it, but like the dorm leaders were like, right, the campers are all gonna pray. Like, ask, ask God for whatever's on your mind. And I remember thinking like, it's like only, only the headmaster prays. Like why, you know, why is, why is he asking us to pray? But that, that was like, that was my first real exposure to like intentionally reading the Bible and intentionally praying. Um, up until that point, it's like I hadn't really met many Christians. I'd met quite a lot of people who like went to church and stuff, but I started to meet sort of like real Christians and my mind started to change and I became less cynical. Um, at the end of that summer then, a friend of mine who I'm really, really good friends with now at the time, I just sort of knew him, his family invited me into church then. So that's the age I was about coming 17 and that was the first time I went to church. So that pretty much takes me up to where I am now. Um, you know, sort of got more and more involved since then. But the message, whenever, whenever Keith sort of said about like, you know, talking about this kind of testimony, then the message was sort of clear to me because I have very strong feelings about like, what really, really important factors were behind me becoming a Christian and what, what led me to sort of become a Christian. So I do have um, a short message to sort of go through that, that follows on from that. Um, so if everyone could open their Bible, if you have it handy on you, to uh, the book of Colossians and to chapter 4. So I'll give everyone a bit of time to do that. Um, I'm just going to start off with a really, really short reading. It's just from verse 2 um, to the end of verse 6. So it says under the, under the title, Further Instructions. Devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message, so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ, for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace and seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Um, so that's, that's the sort of passage that came straight to mind. I'm going to talk about sort of the... the so the end of that um, passage first, and particularly this reference to sort of like conversation being gracious and filled with salt. I think it probably came up one time at camp years ago, whenever people say about being salty nowadays. It's kind of like people think of like people who are really, really twisty and hard to work with. And, um, but there's a very, very different meaning here. So I'm going to break it into two parts. Back at the time, whenever, whenever Paul is writing this, Paul, like, as everyone will know, caters to his audience, to who he's writing for. Um, and at the time, like, we kind of forget the importance of it now, but at the time, the importance of salt, it was so important that it, be it became a kind of cultural thing, and it was used in loads and loads of, like, metaphors and sort of turns of phrase that they would have had. Um, so one way of looking at salt was that salt was a basic need. At the, the poorest level of society back then, salt would have been your means of literally keeping your food. If you didn't have any salt, your food would have spoiled. It was to stop rot and preserve the stuff that you wanted to keep. Um, and the reason he, he uses that is because it's important whenever we talk to the Bible terms outsiders, whenever we're talking to non-Christians, the first port of call is we have to remember that it is a basic need. It's that there will be non-Christians who feel that you know, they have needs or wants or whatever. They'll think they need a nice job and they need you know, a nice car and a happy relationship and stuff like that. But the first protocol here for Paul is, at the lowest level, salt is a need. Like if poor people back then did not get salt, they would, they would die. Um, also, like Paul, as we know, got himself into loads of trouble. He used lots of, like, everyone, he used lots of military metaphors before. Paul would have been very, very well frequented with Roman soldiers because he spent that much time in jail. And one of the things back then that the soldiers in the Roman army would have got their house for free, they lived in barracks. Um, you know, they would have got their clothes for free because it would have been uniform and stuff. And they got what was called a salarium, which was literally just a salt allowance, because that's how important it was. That was what money was left. They were given a packet of money to go and buy salt for their food to keep it. Um, and he, he plays on that importance. He's, he's using a phrase that everyone back then will have known. But the bottom line is, at that lowest point, it is a need. So just like salt was a need back then, Whenever you go to outsiders, even though they probably don't want to talk about God and they don't want to talk about anything to do with Christianity, you still have to remember that it is a basic need for them, even though they probably don't want it. Um, because, like in my experience, 
I didn't want it. But years and years on later down the line, through people chipping away over years and years of, of overflowing the fruits of the Spirit, I went from sort of thinking like, I don't know what they're at, and I was very cynical of them, and I thought it was all a show, to like, they clearly have something, or they know something that I don't, and I was like, I want that. I, I sort of realized, like, I don't know what it is, but I went after it. The second side of his use of, of salt, the metaphor of salt, was at the very, very top end of society back then, salt was still important, because salt was seasoning. It didn't matter how much money you had, even if you had all the money in the world and all the food in the world and you could keep it, you still put salt on your food to make it taste nicer. So he's using that metaphor because whenever we talk to people, the discussion has to be, as he says, seasoned with salt. Whenever you talk to non-Christians, um, as I said, they're probably not going to want to hear the message, but you can still season the conversation with salt. And by that, it means still conducting yourself in a Christian manner that comes across that, as I said, you don't really know what's going on, but they start to notice. Whenever I was a non-Christian, I was invited into, like, like the guy I worked, the farmer I worked for would have invited me in for lunch every day. So at the start, I thought they're all a bit strange, but then spending like an hour or two in his house every day over, like, say, the whole summer holiday, you start to realize that, like, no, actually, this, this isn't a show. These people conduct themselves like this all the time. Um, and as a non-Christian, I really, really started to notice that. Nine times out of ten, I was sitting at his dinner table, I wasn't talking about God. He wasn't talking about Christianity. He very, very rarely asked me any of it. But he always seasoned that conversation with salt. He always conducted himself in a certain manner, and, you know, in interactions with his wife, and she conducted herself in the same way, and the children. And the whole family atmosphere was just very, very clearly different to what I was used to. So that kind of made it clear to me that there was something different about them. Um, Tying it back into the earliest part of that section then. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. And then in verse 5 it says, be wise in the way you act towards outsiders, making the most of every opportunity. Um, I remember hearing once, it was John Eady, who was a, a Scottish theologian in the 17th century, said that uh, the life of the church was possibly the only Bible that the non-believer would read. Um, and that was at a time when everyone went to church just for the sake of it. Nowadays, it was probably even more narrow for me. For me, it was the life of a Christian household, or just literally three or four Christians, was the only Bible I'd read at that point. Um, I hadn't read a Bible at that point, hadn't went to church. So the way certain families conducted themselves, <clears throat> the way they treated me and, and looked out after me, was literally the only Bible I was reading. I wasn't getting anything anywhere else, was getting no teaching. Um, so that made me sort of aware that I had to do something. Whenever I started going to church, it was kind of tricky. Because of my background, um, not being from a religious family, uh, I, had, I had an issue where, as I said earlier, I prayed um, and I, I felt the need to read the Bible. I had this real issue where I read the Bible and I was suddenly wanted to believe it, but I still didn't believe it. Because of the way I was brought up, like I went to school, I'd you know, been showered with books, you know, and I was, I was just struggling with it. And, um, you know, you need people like that. You go to church and you get your teaching and you'll get people to tell you what to do. And then there was a, certain key speakers explaining certain things. Um, and it was just a lot of good people pointing me in the direction of good resources. So even outside of church and their family life, they were still looking out for me. They were still pointing me in the direction of, you know, where I could get answers. Like, even if I didn't say it, they knew I was struggling with something. And they knew I needed something answered to sort of feel right. Um, so again, for anyone, I don't know if there's any non-Christians in here or anyone who comes from that background, from my first prayed and decided I wanted to read the Bible, I couldn't really call myself a Christian at that point because... I didn't really believe completely. It took me about a year to go full circle. Um, so it took me like a year of going to church and getting pointed in the direction of answers before I actually could say, you know, I could look at the Bible and say, yes, I believe this, and I am now a Christian. Um, and that, that's due to the, the conduct of Christian families. It's due to how they act, like, every day. And this is the thing I said earlier, like, 
after I decided to, to pray and read the Bible, basically the next while was just being put in the path of certain Christians who would then sort of influence me. And I think it's really, really important for probably a lot of you out there because I said number earlier on, the numbers sort of increased. I met people like Keith and Rebecca. I know like Keith's brother Clive I met and there's loads of other really nice people at camp um, who initially shocked me, but then I grew to really, really like. And <laughs> it was just, it was so overwhelming at the time, but I would say the number one issue with a lot of like people who come from a non-Christian background is they're just so cynical. And I was, I was really, really cynical at the time. I would say, like, my mom's not a Christian. I would say the number one reason my mum is not a Christian is because really, bar, like, me and a few friends who she's met lately, and she's, like, you know, softened her opinion on them a bit. In my mum's youth, I don't think she met a Christian. Like, she went to church. She went to Sunday school when she was really, really young. But there's, like, <clears throat> like, whenever I was young, I lived in an estate. You go out into an estate, and there's just thousands of people who just look at churches and Christians and say, like, they're no different, and they just think they're all, you know, hypocrites. But the problem, the problem is, all it takes is for them to just meet sort of the right family, like literally the right, just the right family who does treat them well and look out for them. And probably loads of you meet them all the time. You meet them in work, and you meet them in school, and like other children that go to school, your children, and you probably think absolute hallions. And sometimes you may be like, lose the rag with them. It's like how how could anyone do anything with them? Like, there is definitely hope. You know, it says in the Bible, there's more joy, more joy in heaven over one repentant sinner. Even if you only got one, all it takes is for them to sort of be in your influence. There's a lot of Christians I met who, like, I think they are worth their weight in gold, and they probably don't know it. And there's Christians I met, like, at a farm that I work for, I haven't even seen in years. So he probably doesn't even know the impact he's had. Because um, he wasn't out trying to sort of, you know, put on a show, and he wasn't out trying to be nice. They were just, like naturally nice and that was the thing that really, really confused me at the start they were just exhibiting fruits of the spirit but before i had that explained to me i just thought this is all a facade this is all just like an exhibition um, and that, that's the thing following on from that cynical attitude i went from sort of like being really, really cynical about 14 15 to the time i was 17 they kind of just softened me up a bit they sort of been they killed me with kindness basically I've got to that stage, and as I said earlier, the number one kind of thought in my head, the only way I could sum it up was, they had something that I suddenly wanted. I was like, I didn't really understand it, but I was like, it's really, really nice, whatever it is. And that was the only way I could explain it. So the message I just want to leave you with is um, that, as I said earlier, there's an awful lot of you who are probably doing really, really good work. And the Bible says we should never tire of doing good work. Um, and you probably don't even realize it. But I would just like to stand in here as somebody who came from a non-Christian background. I would like to say that it is people like a lot of yourselves that without really knowing it are having like a massive impact. Because even if you only get one you know, person who decides to sort of turn, like if that person's like me and they then decide to start helping out of their YF or helping out of their BB or whatever, like you'll, you'll never really know for a long time what impact you're having. So that's, that's really just the message I want to leave you with today, that it does say you should never tire of doing good work, but that there's a lot of people in here, and there's a family service, and it's a celebration of the family. For me, Christian families probably were the number one earthly factor in me becoming a Christian. So although it says you should never tire of doing good work, um, the message I just want to leave on is that it's a lot of people like yourselves who are doing good work, and probably don't even know it. So that's really all I wanted to say. Thank you.